Good evening. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum of American Art, and I hope you are all ready to get something to eat. I'm starving now, and if this hasn't whetted your appetite, I'm not quite sure what will. Um, I see we have great turnout tonight. I guess you all heard that the first 500 people to join get meals delivered to their homes. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this conversation with um, Marcus Samuelson. The images we were just looking at are from Marcus's new cookbook, The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food. The music we were just listening to is by um, artist, musician Jason Moran, who is a composer who has, was recently featured at the Whitney in a major solo exhibition in 2019, um, curated by our wonderful curator, Adrian Edwards. Um, he's one of the many collaborators that Marcus works with. I'm thrilled to welcome my friend Marcus this evening to talk ideas, talk about food, and in particular his commitment to black cuisine and black chefs. Marcus specializes in not just a feast for the palate, but for the eyes, the ears, and the heart. He's not only changed the conversation around cuisine, but around American culture itself. Marcus needs no introduction, but why not? His innovative spirit and dedication to excellence and his culinary endeavors have made him a beloved cultural leader in New York City and around the world. With 10 restaurants to date in New York, Marcus may be best known as a co-owner of the Red Rooster in Harlem. He was the youngest chef to earn a three-star review in the New York Times and has numerous James Beard Foundation awards. He also wrote the best-selling memoir, Yes, Chef, in 2013 about his journey from Ethiopia to Sweden and eventually to an America. He is also now an advisor and a guest editor for Bon Appetit magazine. Marcus has been a judge on Top Chef, Iron Chef and Chopped and many others. He was also the guest chef for Barack Obama's first state dinner for the Indian prime minister in 2009. And he's even made a guest appearance in 2018 for Scooby-Doo and the Gourmet Ghost. The critically acclaimed cookbook, which we will be talking about this evening, The Rise, Black Cooks and Soul of American Food, was released just this past fall and highlights not only the diversity of Black culinary traditions in New York City and beyond, but also how Black artists and chefs have connected through cultural realms. It was named the top cookbook of 2020 by Amazon, which is no small feat. In all his work, Marcus is committed to his community, whether through his work through, with the careers through culinary arts program, organizing the Harlem Eat Up Festival, or more recently, turning several of his restaurants into community kitchens during the COVID-19 epidemic, serving over 215,000 meals to those in need during time of great insecurity. There are so many synergies and parallels between the Whitney Museum's mission and Marcus's work. Marcus, like the Whitney, is continually raising such timely and urgent questions as what constitutes America? Who is an American? Why are all the arts, including the culinary arts, essential to our lives? If the arts are about all the senses, what is a museum's responsibility to cuisine? What is the linkage between social justice and aesthetics? Mm -hmm. Marcus is one of the most energetic, enthusiastic, synthetic thinking, omnipresent individuals in our city and country. He is not merely a chef, a restaurateur, an author, a professor, a food guru. He actually was um, uh, uh, um, uh, the star of a, um, a, a, a program called Inner Chef, a media personality and a social activist. He is a paradigm shifting, boundary crossing public intellectual. It is my great honor to introduce Marcus Samuelson. Marcus, hey. welcome. How are you? That right. was that was fabulous. That was like whoa. okay. I'll do it again. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Great, to, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Very, very happy to be here, Adam. And I just love that as the art and culture in the city that we're sticking together. We are now figuring out how can we navigate through this through our communities. Where we are so thirsty to stay connected, to stay together. And I just love this. So this is a thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be uh, partnering with Whitney on this. And uh, we've had a lot of fun planning it. So thank you. 
Oh, great pleasure. And just for those of you out there looking and seeing the double U over my shoulder, yes, it's an upside down McDonald's sign. <laughs> So it is about food, but it's actually an artwork by an artist named Virginia Overton. It's the W for Whitney. But we're not going to be talking about that food tonight. We're going to be talking about Marcus. And I thought we'd do just a little history, if we could, first, Marcus, for some of the people who don't know you. In your bio, you're referred to as an Ethiopian Swedish chef. Your new cookbook is about Black food in America, but it's also about the diaspora of, of Black cooks. Um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to all of those different realms? Mm -hmm. One of the blessings about being American and becoming an American is how layered and complex our narratives are. And that's what we're figuring out at this very moment, right? The fact that someone can start, be American, but the starting point, there was a hut in Ethiopia through Sweden and today be American. And there lies the beauty and there lies the complexity in our culture, in our food and in our diversity. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the most incredible things about being American is that you can have three windows in to different places. And I think we all on this Zoom today have those three places that might not be geographically as, as different as Ethiopia, Sweden, and New York, but it could be where you grew up, where you went to college, and where you consider home today. So it's a good exercise to really put yourself in other thought processes and, and understand other things. Like Ethiopia is vastly different than Manhattan and Sweden is also extremely different than Harlem, right? But there's still something, there's a thread there. There's humanity, there's a desire to improve and there's a desire for community to stick together. And tell me, when did your interest in cooking begin? And how did it begin? You know, I, I think that food in many ways has always been central to me. Even when my mother that passed away, that when she did the walk from the village to Addis, she thought about, we walked at night. She brought dry food with her. Eventually she passed away, but we survived. But coming to Sweden later on, my grandmother Helga, that was a domestic, she was, you know, started work at 11, she was a domestic. So her gift to the world was cooking. Mm -hmm. And that's what she shared with us. It was not a foreign language. It was not that she was a math genius or none of this stuff, but her mm -hmm. gift to us was foraging, food and cooking. So when you came to her house, her way of showing love was showing us how to pickle herring showing us how to roll Swedish meatballs, showing us how to bake bread. And that warmth and love that I got from my grandmother, I had no idea that that 40 years later would be the profession that I would trade in and have taken me from Japan to the White House, from Australia to Harlem. And how did you end up in New York? You know, I would say, Adam, that one of the blessings about being black and being an immigrant is that you constantly are, you, 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 you're getting challenges in front of you that might be at the moment, very, very difficult. But if you know how to navigate through that, there is an incredible sense of self-belief and I can do this that comes after that. The challenge is everyone can navigate through it. When I was finished with my internship in France, at a three-star Michelin restaurant. And I felt like that. I climbed a mountain, an achievement that I always wanted to do. Chef asked me, hey, you coming with me to Cannes this summer? We're gonna open the summer restaurant. And I said, no, I feel like I graduated. I wanted, he's like, what do you wanna do? I'm gonna open my own restaurant just like yours. And he said, it's not possible. Do you know any black restaurant in Europe that has two stars, three-star Michelin? I said, no. So he's like, that's the answer. You can work in a restaurant, but you can't own one. And that was the moment when I knew I had to go home. I had to speak to my parents. And I sat on a 38 hour, 40 hour train ride back to Gothenburg. And by the time I got home, my father that knew nothing about cooking, he said, you're going to New York. Mm. Do you know anyone in New York? I said, I do. He said, you know, there used to be a black mayor in New York City. If they can choose a black mayor, they will make space for a black chef. And that was it. 
Hmm. It's a wonderful story. And then how did you end up at Aquavit? I think it wasn't that your first yeah. real big? Sure. Um, I, I grew up in the restaurant world at Aquavit. I was 23. I learned so much about being a minority in terms of a Swedish sense, like how do you put out a minority cuisine? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the fact at that point I've worked in Japan, I worked in Switzerland, I worked in France, so I had a good CV, good resume. I got a job, I knew somebody at Aquavi, and the fact to have that security of a Swedish restaurant and knew I could get a job there, got a job, and Aquavi was also the place where um, I got to understand New York, how New York City worked, you know? And it was also in Midtown, so it was very grown up, but it was very adult experience. <laughs> so I feel like there are, I have so many of my blessings to start at Aquavi and to be able to navigate through it. And I learned a lot. I have a lot to think to be grateful for, for my years at Aquavi. So at what point did, you, did it click that you weren't gonna just keep making Swedish food and you would start focusing on black cuisine or, or, you know, was this part of a search of origins for yourself? I think as an artist, as a creative, it's very important to constantly evolve and being curious, right? I, I, I just today actually had the opportunity to speak to Brown University and the students, their questions were just brilliant, right? And I'll tell you what, it was two things that happened in the early 2000s. One, was I did a cooking demo at the Culinary Institute of America and a student asked me, here you are talking about fluently in Japanese food or fluently in French food, what about African food? And I find myself stuttering and I did not know how to articulate myself. And I, I struggled with that and it was really an identity changer for myself. I had to search deeper and that question really led me to search for my Ethiopian father, our identity, and eventually learn more about my, myself and my family. And I eventually met my, I had eight more sisters and brothers in Ethiopia and so on. The other major event, mm -hmm. not similar to this moment, but still was 9-11. Mm -hmm. After 9-11, I asked myself, you know, I cooked at the towers the weekend before. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself, what's the point? Like, why do I only cook for the 1% of the 1% here in Midtown? It's got to be something more important. And that was really when I was speaking to my mom a lot, searching for soul searching. She said, move to community and move to a place where you can cook for the neighborhood. And for me, that was Harlem. Mm -hmm. And it was eight years between moving to Harlem and opening Red Rooster. But it was also enough time for me to be a good student, to learn about the beauty of Harlem and the beauty of black culture that I had to go and search for it. It wasn't a blog, there was not a newspaper. I had to go on that journey. And it was a fascinating journey that taught, taught me a lot about the history of black culture. And how about the history of black food? Because when you were opening the restaurant, who were your teachers in that process? And, who were, and how did you learn in that eight year period that then became Red Rooster? Well, it's all about community, right? I had incredible mentors like, you know, Dapper Dan taught me about merchant and he told me also the difference between the Tenenbaum and the projects and the, the challenges within that. But what, I, what, I, what that meant, I had people like Bevy Smith or Janelle Prokol or Thelma Golden that could take, teach me about art and culture and Lana Turner. But it was also, some of the beauties about black culture is that it's, it's not always official. Sometimes it's an underground. So if I wanted a great cornbread, there wasn't the restaurant for me that I should go to. It could have been in the after church program. If I wanted to find the best jerk chicken, that was in the park in Marcus Garvey Park on Saturdays. If I wanted a seafood guy, you know, that was a lobster Mike that pulled up uh, at a specific day outside the subway station. So very much like hip hop, it was the culture of the street and it was about capturing that. Mm -hmm. And so much about black culture lives what we call underground, but eventually becomes the mainstream. And for me, it was searching for that, doing my own take of that, bringing that into the four walls of Red Rooster and then broadcast that. So on Sunday, there was gospel music 
but also making a menu that was connected to spirituality. On Mondays, it could have been jazz, but making food that had the tempo of jazz, maybe even look at a New Orleans, for example. So it gave me not just a, a schedule of what to do, it also gave me a roadmap mm -hmm. that was beyond cooking. It was about art, people, hospitality, and food. So if you were, if you had a great cornbread in Marcus Garvey Park, would you then go up to somebody and say, so tell me your recipe or how did you, I mean, you know, I mean, how did you find the <laughs> recipes or you're not even gonna tell us those secrets? Well, it, it was one of the, you know, one of the blessings for me about this was as a, as a young chef and as a chef that accomplished a lot, it was almost like I had to throw all those skill sets what I learned downtown in France away. I had to relearn because my muscle memories of food growing up with meatball, herring, and maybe gravlocks. I didn't have memories of eating cornbread. I didn't have memories of making fried chicken. So I had to relearn this. And I can think about if you've been through an incident and then you're learning how to rewalk again. And this was the amazing gift of cooking and having mentors. So there was a lot of people in my staff that's like, like, like Chef Ed that came from the South. It's like, no, Marcus, you're wrong about this. This is how we have to be. Mm -hmm. And this back and forth of, can you chef through a community in a different way? Right. Not always having all the answers. So this was a very important time mm -hmm. and learning blackness, right? Mm -hmm. And my Ethiopian Afghan lens was needed, but it was not always at the forefront. And that was great for me. Right. It's, it's a different way of leading. It's leading from within, not from the yeah. cover. Yeah. It's fascinating. So when you opened the Red Rooster, um, one of the things you did is start working with um, lots of different artists. And um, I think we have a few images. I can just cycle through them quickly if we would, and just for um, people to get a, just a, a little sampling. And, but I'm just curious, as we're looking at these, um, Marcus, um, you know, how did you meet the artists um, and how did you collaborate with them? Did you just invite them to do what they wanted to? Did they propose things to you? Um, what was the process? It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing group of artists, um, better known and lesser known, young and old, um, and a variety of different idioms. Well, once again, it was through the community, you know, I asked, you know, people, I'm, I'm fortunate to have friends like, you know, Ray McGuire and Thelma Golden, but also I came up in the 90s with amazing people, right? Sanford Bigger and I came up at the same time. Julia Hector and I are, are, you know, the closest of friends, you know what I mean? And, you know, be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with Derek Adams, for example. So that creative journey of, speaking to Lorna, speaking to Glenn Lygen, that Glenn was one of the first people I sat down with. And it wasn't about Glenn, can we have your art on the wall? It was, I needed to show Glenn that I was serious about this. Here's what I'm thinking. And I was also wrong most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. What I was thinking about was to have Jean-Michel Basquiat on the walls. And Thelma's like, no, it needs to be about people who have either lived in Harlem or worked through and, and been in the neighborhood. And that just helped me, that level of guidance that Thelma gave me, right? Allowed us then to say, okay, the way I thought about it was not accurate at this moment. That doesn't mean I'm not a Sean Michel fan. It just wasn't what we needed to do here. So then, you know, being able to constantly think through this. And then in the beginning was maybe Mark Bradford. It was being able to, Sandy and I, you know, always, always collaborated on things. So I think the first generation really gave itself. You know, there was Derek Adams, there was Sanford Biggers, there were Lorna, Lorna Simpson, and it was this process of thinking it through that way. And then also giving room for people coming up right that was not as established as them and 
So, so having the Studio Museum as a partner and also obviously having the incredible Thelma Golden as, as beyond the partner, actually as the boss, right? <laughs> that was helpful. You know, just as much as going to the Apollo and saying, we're gonna do music, we're not here to compete with the Apollo, but then showing your cards right. and going down to Lennox Lounge saying, this is what we're gonna do. We don't wanna compete with you, but how do we build something together? So transparency and showing that these institutions were first and how can we add value as a partner to these incredible institutions? Um, also have to say, Schomburg was a huge help for me because mm -hmm. so much of the work that I needed to research was at the Schomburg. So I went there a lot. And then um, um, there was National Black Theater. So, you know, Harlem is not huge, but it has this dignity in terms of institutions. Mm -hmm. And once you walk through these institutions, there's a lot of knowledge there. And that's what we uploaded. Yeah. I have to say, I'm very touched because you're such an accomplished and extraordinary person, Marcus. But the thing I'm most struck about is what an incredible student you are. And I think that that process of always learning in the short time I've known you, just the way you take it all in and everything is an opportunity to learn something new is just, it's really extraordinary. I thought maybe we could um, show uh, just a, um, let's try to turn to our conversation about the rise, which I love the title itself. I mean, that says it all, I think in many ways, but um, I thought maybe we could just show a, sh um, a, sh uh, a short video. Um, uh, and if everybody gets out their pen and paper, they can start um, writing it down. Uh, here's the cover of the rise and I will talk a little bit about the book and and the look and everything, which is fantastic. Um, but why don't we go to the video and then I'll we'll ask um, talk, talk about the book. What's up? We're back cooking from the rise. You know, I love telling these stories and sharing these stories, stories from black cooks in America. This recipe was really inspired by Mr. Stephen Satterfield and Whetstone Magazine. He always connects the diaspora and black chefs and culinarians around the country. So this is our spice roasted black cod with venison seed, vinaigrette, and carrots. Venison seeds really stem from Nigeria and Ghana, and it's really sesame seed. When you think about it as a sesame seed roasted cod, it sounds delicious. So all we're gonna do is actually just put some a nice good spice mix. Could be berbere, could be al hanout. Just gonna toss this together here. Same thing with the cod. We're just gonna add our spice blend. Good. Top of the fish. Beautiful, <laughs> nice. So cod. Oh, yeah, when we great. cook fish, I like to mix oil and butter. I'm just gonna toss this vinaigrette lightly with the carrots. I don't want too much. I don't want this to burn. I'm gonna add some nice fresh herbs, sage, basil parsley, just like that. I'm gonna put it in the pan. What we did with the carrots, we're also gonna do with the cod. Add the fresh herbs into that. When I cook seafood, fish, I always add some lime or lemon, so I'm just gonna add that in here as well. And you don't want the bennet seeds to stick, so I'm just gonna add in a little bit more butter. Every recipe in the rice, we honor one chef. And this one's gonna be Mr. Steven Satterfield that has his own magazine, started his own publishing company. And I think it's so important that you start learning about the culinary field in the black space is completely diverse. One of the most fun things about doing this project was to find these incredible depths in what we're doing in the culinary field right now. And Steven is a great example of that. Great culinary background, started his magazine. All right, so this is ready. I'm just gonna put this in the oven. Look at that. Start pan searing it in the pan. Now we're just gonna roast it in the oven and then it's ready to serve. All right, so this is just gonna cook for another five minutes in the oven and then it's done. All right, look at that. Our cod is ready to go. Nice, flaky, the carrots are cooked. So we're ready to plate. The journey of the rice is also to rewrite the history and, and rectify it. So much of our food has been taken away from us, from the continent, but also the words has changed. This Venice's roasted cod could have been called sesame roasted cod, but the Venice's probably opened up some conversations, just like peanuts came to this country, just the way rice, okra, and so many other things that came to our country via West Africa. All the flavors is right here, right? The Benesee vinaigrette. Now when we had it in the oven, this is where we have all the flavors. 
So I'm just gonna dress that on top as well. And that's where that nutty flavor comes from now. That's where the flavor is gonna come shine through. What I've enjoyed so much with doing the rice is to connect the black food community with the larger hospitality and restaurant community, but not just chefs, writers, winemakers, customers, consumers, everybody. Our stories have not been shared enough. Go and visit these chefs, go and visit these incredible craftspeople. They deserve it and their food is amazing. Feed your curiosity, cook from the rice, tell your friends, share stories. What could be more delicious than learning something new that still has familiar roots and you go to the next dinner party and say, hey, guess what I just learned or guess what I just had? <laughs> Enjoy the rice. So tell Marcus, so how did you um, select the chefs that you featured um, uh, here? I mean, I know you had a, a television um, show called No Passport Required. I always love the name of that. And probably some came out of that, I imagine. But um, these, these are chefs from coast to coast, north to south. Um, yeah, I mean, I want Usai and I that we collaborated on this. It was important that some of them are people that I worked with at Red Rooster, but this is not a list. And it was also important that they did not just come from the Red Rooster family, right? Because then it's really not a true a display of where we are in food and black food and America's food today. So uh, also, so it was speaking to mentors and friends of mine, like Eduardo Jordan, that is in Seattle, an amazing chef, or Greg Godet in Portland, Naisha Arrington in Los Angeles. So spreading this so people can't come and say, it only happens on the coast. Black cooking American food is happening all over the country. Knowing, anticipating what the question would be from the community. Well, how do I, how do I support? Well, this is how you can support. So we, we did a deeper dive in, in about 40 chefs and food writers and winemakers. Then we listed another 200 so this really shows the ubiquitous and the, the plurethal of our journey mm -hmm. because I knew there was a major gap between what was happening and the public's larger understanding about black food. When I think about, for me, pop culture, mm -hmm. the way America thinks about black culture and pop culture is almost one from gospel to rock and roll to R&B to funk to hip hop, to even trap. You can think about it, what era, and we will know that. Well, if that's one of the measurement, we are far behind. Mm -hmm. I even think that art has done it, you know, through the layers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we know about, you know, Jacob Lawrence, and we know about Ramar Bearden's, and then we know about the amazing uh, 70s and the 80s, and out of that come the generation that you think about what Thelma and the community has built on from that, right? And therefore you have the Glenn Ligens, the Julia Mariatu, the Carol Walkers and so on. That's, those were my two measurements in terms of where I wanted us to go mm -hmm. in terms of the food. So it was making it vast, mm -hmm. showing our diversity, mm -hmm. that why would black food, even the idea that black food would be monolithic, you know, that is just so strange to me. Mm -hmm. So it was about, simplifying it so people can understand, first of all, there's five original cuisine in America that is linked to blackness. Barbecue, Cajun, Creole, low country and Southern food, mm -hmm. right? It's all America's food that really comes from the diaspora. Right. But then also think about it in terms of authorship. If mm -hmm. we have the right authorship about something, right. the people that should be credited gets credited. Memories, the memories part of how we celebrate things are important, right? and start thinking about these memories as they're connected to black culture. That helps tourism and the way we think about mm -hmm. how we travel and our neighbors. And then the last part, aspirations, because that then allows us to think about who wants to come into our field, who values it. So those three pillars were very important to me. And I mean, I like, I love, you start with the epigram, it says black is not a taste or is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it? Well, I think that it's really important to ask questions that are unanswered mm -hmm. unless you go through this journey, right? Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it, it allows everyone in. You have to create an environment that everyone feels, this is my journey too, right? This is my art, this is our art. And as mm -hmm. incredible as American diverse it is, it's on us to tell the story and create the mm -hmm. story. It's for our audience to come into it ask questions, sometimes have a clumsy journey into it, and that's okay, mm -hmm. you know, but for us then to be guided through, and I tell you, although COVID has been very, very difficult and hit our black restaurants and, and, and crafts people very, very hard, you can also argue it's one of the best times. We have some of the most influential writers are happening right now, like Dr. Jessica Harris, Tony Tipton Martin, our dear friend Clancy Miller just started a food publication called For the Culture. Mm -hmm. So in the worst of time, can also the best of work mm -hmm. happen? Well, guess what? That's what's happening in art community constantly. Right. So there is something that we share there. You, you, you said food has always been part of the movement for racial justice. Can you talk, talk a little bit about that and how you think of the book in relationship to that? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a great question. First of all, since food comes, black food very often comes out of domestic, right? And it didn't change for a long, long time. So there's some stigma there. But for example, think about, think about the vote, Lyndon B. Johnson, one of his trust, he trusted his chef, which was a beautiful black lady, more than he trusted other people in Congress. But it was family of Miss Wright that was in front of him constantly. And he really listened to her mm -hmm. more than he listened to a lot of people in the, in, in the in Senate and Congress, right? Mm -hmm. You think about an advocate, an activist like Miss Leah Chase that just passed away 18 months ago from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The first 15 to 20 years of the restaurant, she broke the law every day. She served white and black people. So think about the chances as a black woman in the South that she had to break the law and to, to just do what she felt was right. Mm. So there are so many examples, you know, there are this incredible uh, woman, Georgina, that she saved, she was a mother of six, single mother of six. Mm -hmm. She made cakes and saved hundred dollars a week. Mm and gave it to uh, the civil rights movement every week, right? Mm -hmm. This is a single mother of six. She woke up three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and do, did that for years. And mm -hmm. these are these unsung heroes that mm -hmm. are the shoulders that I stand on, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a hard time. Mm -hmm. We, I, you know, as an immigrant and as a black person, I wouldn't be here without law changes in terms of civil rights movement and law changes in terms of immigrants. So. It's very important for me that I do, and my community, we do our part and move the conversation forward. Mm, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing to think of the, the power that food can have in those mm -hmm. contexts. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, you know, I'm just gonna go to the table of contents, just one image for a second, because I have to say, um, the way your book is constructed is absolutely magnificent. The word I think of is actually architecture. I mean, you discussed the, the um, your your um, your three pillars already, but I love the way you'd. First of all, I have to say, just it is so easy and simple to find your way through, and it is a delight for the eye. I mean, and I, I sound like a salesman here, and it's it, it's a, but it is it's it's just an incredibly beautiful book. But I I love the way you break these five chapters into next remix migration legacy and origin, and. Um, I'm just curious, you know, normally you would think you'd start with origin and you'd end with next. Why did you do that the other way around? Wow. Um, <laughs> I feel like um, you talk about architecture. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like the blessings of being here is, you know, you have to acknowledge privilege, right? Like I'm in a village of the fact that we opened this with Jason Moran, for example, right? So, or the fact that someone like David Ajay has completely formed how I think about structure, right? So the luxury of having access to some of the brightest thinkers in not just in black spaces, but in the world, in their fields, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when, you, we, when we talk about black excellence, I, those 
are the people that I think about when I, I want to be the entryway to be aesthetically beautiful, but also functional at the same time. And I thought it was important with Next because there is a uh, very important vibrancy in our food right now. And mm -hmm. Patricia Gonzalez, that is the youngest member in the book, was 17 when we started it. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we know her journey because when I was coming up, there was no cookbooks that was not written by men mm -hmm. or were French. I couldn't find it. So for me, it's always like, Marcus, you gotta write books that whether you're a young person in the industry or whether you've been in the industry for a while, that solve something. And mm -hmm. if they're not solution-based, so, but both aesthetically, but also there is a vibrancy. So this book is an honor of Ms. Leah Chase, but it's also for Miss Patricia Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. It can be both. Mm -hmm. And the aesthetic, we have an aesthetic, right? Whether it's the tribalism in, out of Africa, or there is the, the way that we show our culture that is linked to very much the American South. Why not bring that out? You know, the way that I, when I did the Aquavit cookbook, I knew which blue I wanted to create. And I knew the images had to be sort of daylight images, almost like an Irving pen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that was that book, but that was the right medium for that book. This is not that. This is something else. Mm -hmm. No, I love you sort of turn it on its head. Most people would have started with the origin, but you start yeah. with the now going backwards the, or, or forwards, depending on how mm -hmm. you look at it. Um, uh, you know, I love, um, were you thinking, I mean, when you, I mean, this is, you know, one of the first, I mean, I think this is going to be the, the book that is on everybody's shelf in terms of black food. I mean, this will be your, were you thinking at all of the kind of the Julia Child, James Beard? I mean, where you were gonna create something that was going to be kind of foundational in that sense? I mean, I think, you know, I think the, the amazing thing about this book is it's an encyclopedia in yeah. one way. It's a source book, it's a compendium, mm. it's a it's a geographical, it, it's all of these intersections and, yeah. um, and, and um, and actually, despite or, or and because of all the intersections, somehow though it all comes together and it's very, very clear. But I think it, it, it's 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 so foundational in a way. It's like this would be the go-to book I would go to if I were trying to find a recipe in this in the beginning. Well, I, you know, the books takes a long time. They take four years to make, and it was very important. Like Usai and Yawande, Yawande worked with me on the recipes, and Usai is our co-writer. And first of all. Uh, they're both brilliant in their own uh, way. And they brought different things, West Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm from East Africa, but it wasn't just about West Africa, it was specifically Nigeria. And then we talked to somebody else about Senegal, for example. So it was, you know, again, the privilege of having, taking the time out of people. Like you write a book and there's two hours commitment maybe for the reader to cook or read through it. So for me, it's about, this is extremely important, but it needs to be as a fun read. Mm -hmm. And then the information needs to be there, but then the memories out of the food's gotta be delicious. So I, I was extremely excited as we were doing the work, obviously as COVID happened, and also as the social justice conversation happened in our country during the la latter part of the book, I had to stop and add these two notes that I wouldn't have added into the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that meant also that the book came out of time where we're now having these conversations. So, you know, um, I, I felt that this was extremely important, mm -hmm. um, but it, the, it's even more important what's gonna come out of the book, right? Mm -hmm. Just like when we build Red Rooster, what goes in is important, but what's gonna come out of it is the next generation of black culinarians. With this book too, it will be a jump off point. For example, there's two things that we started. We started Black Business Matters Matching Fund, mm -hmm. right? Which gives out grants to black culinarians and businesses during this time. The second thing, again, inspired by the art culture, we will create a residence program out of the rise where we'll give one mm -hmm. person a chance to 
go away, mm -hmm. rethink, reload, and come back to us with her work or his work. Again, I can I have the luxury to look at the Whitney or to look at the Studio Museum or other programs and ask, Adam, how are you doing that? How do you collaborate with that? How does that work? Mm -hmm. Those were not things that I, I know about, but those are the things I have to, that's gonna come out of the rice. You've said that, um, you know, um, recipes connect us to other cultures, but you've also said they adapt to other cultures. And, and, you know, talking about the growth of something, how, how has, you know, how has um, Black food adapted um, and how have you adapted it? How has it shifted? Well, because it's, it's from all over. Yeah, I mean, I can give a couple of examples. When you think about um, a dish like fish and grits, right? And the grits itself has origin in West Africa and the way we think about how it came to the Carolinas and then how it has evolved. But that same dish, grits, when you take it back in Africa, in, in South Africa, it's called pap. And it was Nelson Mandela's favorite meal. Mm -hmm. When you go up north to Kenya, Uganda, it's called ugali. Mm. And it's served in a different way, more with goat or even vegetables, certain, you know, almost like leaves, like flower leaves are more similar to a thicker spinach. And then in the Americas, when it comes, because of its coastal, it's either shrimp and grits or fish and grits, right? So it's just as you follow the, the journey of the noodles and the pasta to Italy from China, from China to Italy, we, our diaspora has the same journey, yet ours is undertold, right? So this is a moment to share that. I think about now like, a spice blend like Berbere out of Ethiopia. Berbere is still a currency in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. It is something that every household makes. And as the Ethiopian diaspora is out in the world, it gets tweaked and changed, whether it's in Germany or England or in Washington, DC, based on sunlight or the terroir of those places, right? But yet you cannot tell an Ethiopian family to cook a meal without Berbere. So we adapt and we change. And um, there is ingenuity in that, but we still hold on to the base of a Berbera will still be there. It might not taste the same as it does in Addis, but the, the, the DNA is there. Yeah, because in your section on migration, you talk about not only what's there, but what has been left behind. Yes, yes. And I also like, I mean, I love the way you talk about the South as a state of mind. What do you think yes. of that? Well, I do think there is, uh, first of all, the reverse migration that is happening as we're speaking. And I think about the food that's gonna come out of that, right? Think about the chefs that are coming from New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and going back to the, you know, the Savannas. And you see examples like a Mashama Bailey, for example, that's one of the most progressive chefs in the country um, and her magical restaurant, Gray, for example, right? Then I do think there is this, just like Africa, if you're not from the South, you cannot well, not quite fully fundamentally understand it. Like New Orleans, you will never figure it out unless you're from New Orleans, right? And because it is, does have this je ne sais quoi about it uh, that is just different. And you should hold on to that because there lies the magic. And we don't have to understand everything, uh, but there is that level of just ingenuity and just brilliance. Uh, uh, you know, you see it in the food, you see it in the music, you see it in the art. I'm just gonna, I will end with one more question and then just kind of open it up. There's, I mean, um, I have so many more questions. We could go all evening, but. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really uh, struck by in the book, and this is another way in which it find, the book is a great read. I have to admit, I've never read a cookbook cover to cover. Mm. Yours was the first. Mm. Um, Thank you. I spent a whole day with it and I just totally enjoyed it. And, um, you know, you have statements from each one of the chefs. And there were a couple of statements, one by Shakira Simley in San Francisco, where she said, food is my lens, but people are my focus. Yes. And another one by Adrian Miller in Denver, any cuisine is in for the long haul when people make it at home. 
Yes. Um, I'd, love, I'd love for you to comment on those too, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I, I think that's the ultimate success of a casino, right? Um, I can't wait for the day when non-Ethiopians are making injera bread and making Ethiopian dishes at home. The way we, you're not calling your friends because you're making an Italian pasta at home, right? The ultimate sort of nod of a welcoming is when we are making it at home. And we've, we've been doing that through, you know, the ways people went from Italian food maybe to making ramen and eventually now we're making Mexican food and eventually that will maybe turn into Korean food, not just ordering it out, but actually making. And hopefully that will learn, turn into food out of Nigeria. Like if you make, you make a fried rice, you can make a jollof rice, right? So that will be happening because we don't just make food out of, there's so many different layers to that. There is, do we tourist to that place? Do we trade with that place? Do we have cultural other, do we, have, do we change art from that place? Do we aspire? So there's so many different reasons and important why it's important for us to bring black cuisine back home to us because it will change the complete dynamic conversation around blackness. Mm. And I, I, I think what could be more delicious conversation around race than to eat and cook from it. And we deserve that because we failed as people to have meaningful conversation around race and culture. And we can do better and food will be the most delicious way. Well, I have to say this was this this has been a delicious conversation. Um, and I love the way you you tantalize the eye and you and you you bring all the sense sen senses alive. And um, and yeah. you know there's the the, the first taste when it hits the palate and then the taste afterwards as well. And it's all the different layers which you experience in the book. So I have, an, an, there's a lot of questions coming in. One from Renee who asks, how are you getting through the pandemic? And out of necessity, are you learning and doing things that you will continue in quote unquote normal times? Sure. Well, thank you for that question, Renee. The pandemic has been very, very hard. Um, I learned that closing Red Rooster in March 15 to converting to community kitchen, I learned a lot. You know, the line from serving people and serving my community. Uh, and then I think it was really the, the, the fighting spirit about how can we help other people in the community? So uh, building the fund has been a big part of that because those are things that's going to be needed. Once the vaccine has hit many communities, the truth is communities like Harlem, Newark, Overtown, still going to experience the pandemic on so many different ways. So my job as someone that has uh, privileges and other revenue streams is to broadcast that and help and get corporate America to navigate through, through that and also get local government to navigate through that. So yeah, I'm sure there's takeout that will continue and, and uh, virtual cooking that will continue post it because consumer behavior has already changed. But more importantly, how I navigate through it, I wanna make sure that my community can navigate through it because Harlem and Overtown and Newark without the black restaurant community is not those neighborhoods without it. Because once restaurant goes, other retail will go as well. And that will not be good for anybody. I got, now this goes to your kitchen, these questions. One from Lauren who says, what is your comfort food when you're at home lounging around in sweatpants and your favorite t-shirt? Uh, well, yeah. I think I have two answers. Making, making pasta with my son or making pizza. We're in the pizza stage right now. So Zion and I, we just did a tomato broccoli pizza uh, over the weekend. He loves the dough. He loves charring the sherry tomatoes. That was the second question from Maria. What is your son's favorite dish? Feeding kids can be difficult. What do you make for him? It sounds well, like he's pizza. super difficult. He loves making it. Uh -huh. He's not a fan even of eating it, but he just loves like rolling out the dough and seeing how it changed, transforming the oven. And But eating part, no, that's up to mommy and daddy to do. So that would probably be my favorite. Well, you, you, you could tell he's, if he likes the rolling part and everything, he's likely to be a sculptor rather than a <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have another another question. How can restaurants and museums contribute to New York City's recovery? Mm. Wow. Well, I think there are the fountains of so many things. Uh, we need art, we need food, we need culture. Uh, we need them as water holes. We need them as gatherings, even as say in social distance gatherings. Uh, but we also need them as a place to understand what we're just going through. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need it for, for places also to breathe and be inspired by, right? When, uh, you know, when the, the way New York City, 2019 in December, right? There was 55 million tourists that came to the city about a year, 50 million people. And that they went to the Whitney, they went to many places, right? In the city restaurants and all of that. Right now, the way a restaurant and the way a museum builds a community starts with the local community and then maybe adds around the tri-state and then eventually you get Europe and South America and Africa to come. Right now for the next 18 to 22 months, we're a local business. Yeah. We have each other. That's it. But that's you a beautiful for New Yorkers, thing. I keep saying. Yes, we're a local. So we got to convert and look at the opportunity of being, it's us, it's right here. Everyone on this Zoom, we're here together. But there's, so, there's a strength in that. And walking out of this moment together can also be a loving, very inspiring time. Yeah. Well, this is almost sort of a related question. Corey asks, Chef, with all that's going on this year, can you talk about the therapeutic properties of food, art, culture, and community in your personal life? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. In the beginning of the pandemic, when nobody delivered food, I remember waiting outside Whole Food for an hour. And I started to think about my Swedish grandmother that grew up during the ransom period books, right? Where you can get one kilo of potato, one, one half a sack of flour. And as I was waiting on the line that here I am 80 years later, and this is actually happening. But rather than feeling sorry for ourselves, or it was just strength. And it was in that line, for example, I decided we're gonna be vegetarian for three months now. Because once you got into the store, there was another hour and push and pull on the, on the protein side. So I'm like, I'm a chef. These people are not. I don't have to fight that over there. Mm -hmm. So it was things like that, looking at the strengths, but also looking at the strengths of my history, where I came from. Also starting to think about the Ethiopian side, getting dried food, chickpeas from Ethiopia, so I can make it a stew that all I needed was some fresh carrots and that chickpea stew. And that gave me strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, so cooking, I've been able to, cook through it was extremely therapeutic. The other thing that was therapeutic for me mm -hmm. was actually going to the restaurant and hand out meals mm -hmm. because giving mm -hmm. I, and, and having a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Like I needed to leave the, put the gloves on, put the uh, mask on. Since I was 17, I cooked every day in my life mm -hmm. and having that rhythm of going to a place. And I was terrified of not having that rhythm. So that was something that, that you, I, I, it humbled me, but it also I learned a lot from doing that. Do you feel that now that you haven't the place in a sense, is, 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 the, is the, the idea of the place of the restaurant as a physical place, as a geography, as a gathering place, is that something that you find is more essential than ever? I mean, you talked about takeout food and, Yes, there's all kinds of virtual things, but um, it's one of the things I miss most in the museum is that sense of place and that sense of actual physical community. Absolutely, and it's, it's a people business, back of the house to front of the house, you know, uh, the dialogue with the purveyors, the back and forth, the incredible uh, dishwashers and these heroes that are in the restaurants that for you, the audience are anonymous, just like a museum, for the audience, it could be anonymous labor, but they are very visible and real for the people that work at. So for us to be able to go back to the restaurants um, this Friday on the 12th 
and be able to, um, you know, I, we opened in Overtown in Miami and it was liberating to have just restaurant issues and then thinking about through how to do that in the best way, very difficult, but I, I definitely me miss this idea of community, both back of the house and front of the house. Yeah, me too. So um, one more focused question, and then we'll end with one other one. And um, this one is from Javon who asks, what, um, uh, what from your diverse background, what is your favorite meal and dish from your cookbook? Mm. That's a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> I would say um, the gumbo from Miss Leah Chase, uh, the enormous amount of learning that I've learned from Miss Chase, uh, the inspiration of having a family business from the 40s, mm -hmm. um, just constantly having her yeah. voice echoing. Marcus, yeah. you gotta aim high, mm -hmm. you gotta aim higher, yeah. constantly pushing us, mm -hmm. uh, realizing that Dookie was the place where you is the place where you want to be seen and seen. Red Rooster's connectivity to that. Walking into her dining room where you have the Jacob Lawrence and the Romar Beardens and the cooks going back and forth. So I would say the gumbo from Miss Leah Chase and um, the gratitude of being able to have an auntie like that and everything that she taught me. Yeah. It's not just the food, it's the it's it's everything about it. Yes. I'm just gonna I will ask my my one last question. That is, you know, you've accomplished so much, Marcus. You you know, you have awards, you've been everywhere, you've you have restaurants, you're involved in the community. Um, um, you know, do you have one ambition? And I use the term ambition in quotes because it's not necessarily about grandness, but is there one thing that you would love to make sure that you realize that you have yet to realize. And again, it doesn't have to be a physical thing or yeah. any way, but you know. Well, out, outside being so excited to watch Zion grow up and, and you know, besides that, I feel, I feel like one of the things that draws me so much to America is this, we are a country of push and pull. And as we, food can really be a part of bringing us together. And um, I think we see signs of that that I feel really excited about. I can't wait uh, in 2024 to cook for the inauguration mm -hmm. of um, Ms. Harris, our first <laughs> female Black president. I'm super excited about that moment. I'm visualizing it and I'm putting it out there. And things like that, like major things that we can achieve. This is what people look to America for. This is why I came to America, for, to create big things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think things like that that are, it's not dividing, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, be part of that. Uh, and, and, and obviously I think a lot about food and the environment and these type of questions, but big things like that, I, it gets me excited. and. In the toughest of time, we still created, we see the best of, of us as, as well. You know, you look at someone like Amanda Gorman, so just to see in, the, in, the, in this back and forth, you see a poet at the Super Bowl. Things like that just makes me, this is why I came here. So I, am, I, am, I wanna be part of those evolution through food. And, um, you know, I also wanna say thank you to New Yorkers for letting an immigrant like myself in and being able to have a dialogue with the public for 25 years. That is something you can't put up on a piece of paper, the gratitude towards that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really, really appreciative. I'm appreciative of the Whitney for, uh, for us as friends to have this dialogue. And I look forward to hopefully we can cook and eat and let's rise together as mm -hmm. a collective. And I can say hearing you talk tonight and, you know, people have worries about New York and they have worries about the future, but hearing you talk tonight, I think for the many people who are on with us, truly inspirational. I think that 
Um, New York has nothing to worry about with people like you um, in it and, um, and bringing everybody together. So it's a privilege to be a New Yorker with you, Marcus. And thank you so much for the conversation tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. See you soon. Thank you. Bye.